In collaboration with Brain Mind, let's discuss vitamins and supplements for optimal brain health and Alzheimer's prevention. Well, now we're going to review the magic pill to prevent Alzheimer's. Wait, unfortunately, we don't have that magic pill. So let's take a step back and think about vitamins and supplements in a very specific, critical, and evidence based way. I'm pro vitamins and pro supplements, but I'm pro evidence. And there's a lot of vitamins and supplements out there. So let's talk about some of the most high yield, evidence based vitamins and supplements. But before we do that, let's take a step back again. The most optimal way to get these vitamins and nutrients is not by necessarily taking a pill, it's by eating whole foods. So in an ideal world, most of us should get a variety of plentiful brain healthy foods, and most of us should be able to get the nutrients that we need to support brain health. However, this isn't always the case. For example, I have patients that are eating brain healthy foods all the time. They're eating fatty fish, they're having their olive oil, they're doing all the right things. But when we check their blood levels, for some reason, their omega-3 fatty acids are low. Their cholesterol is high. And maybe in that specific case, they may need to take a very specific omega-3 fatty acid supplement. So the take home point with vitamins and supplements is simple. There is evidence, strong evidence that certain vitamins and supplements can have an impact on brain health, but the jury is still out on many other vitamins and supplements that we just don't have enough information on. So let's talk about some high yield stuff and focus first on vitamins. The two most evidence based vitamins when it comes to Alzheimer's prevention and optimizing brain health include the B complex vitamins and vitamin D. Let's take a deeper dive. B complex vitamins are brain healthy, but not every single person needs to be on them. So in our clinical practice, we do blood assessments and we try to figure out, well, first of all, do they have a low B12 level? They have a low B12 level. It would make sense to replete that. Why do people have B12 deficiency? Well, believe it or not, as we age, especially people above the age of 50, have problems with absorbing vitamins, specifically B12, in the GI tract. And actually, the USDA recommends that people over the age of 50 consider taking a B12 supplement. You may not have heard that from your doctor, but that's what the USDA recommends. In our clinical practice, we don't make a one size fits all, and instead, we check B12 levels, and we check another level of something called homocysteine. Elevated homocysteine levels, based on the Vitacog studies, dictate that we should be giving those patients B-complex vitamins to lower homocysteine and therefore improve cognitive outcomes and delay cognitive decline. So what are B-complex vitamins? The three most important B-complex vitamins based on the studies include B12, folic acid, and vitamin B6 in a very specific combination. Now let's talk about vitamin D. Vitamin D is a little bit more complicated because some of the research shows that it's positive, meaning more is better. Some of the research is a little bit more confusing. What we've realized also is having low levels is probably a problem, especially lower than 30. But recent studies suggest that when we track vitamin D levels in the blood, the optimal level should probably be closer, not to 30, but closer to 50. And in some people, especially with two copies of the ApoE4 variant, those people specifically may respond better to vitamin D. The important thing about vitamin D that most people don't realize is you can take all the vitamin D you want, but if you take it on an empty stomach without any fat in the meal, that vitamin D won't be absorbed. So a key take home point here is not just to know what you should be taking, but how to take it, when to take it, and in the context of other nutrients. So vitamin D is important, but the jury is still out on exact dose and the exact person uh, that needs to take it. Next, let's talk about omega-3 fatty acids. If I had to choose one brain healthy supplement that probably has the biggest bang for the buck in specific patient populations, there again, not one size fits all, specific patient populations, omega-3 fatty acids are probably the most brain healthy supplement that I can think of. Now, the problem is again, you can eat lots of fatty fish, but still have low omega-3 fatty acid levels. So what we do in our clinical practice is check. There's actually online ways that anyone can really order an omega-3 fatty acid test to check it in their own blood. They'll send you a little kit, they'll do a little prick, you send it back, and then you can know your levels. But ideally, this is something you should talk about with your treating physician.
If we can get the omega-3 fatty acid levels up, and if we can track omega-6 to omega-3 ratios, we can really personalize and optimize brain health over time. But which type of omega-3 should you take? I keep saying omega-3, but you may have heard it as fish oil. Well, all fish oil is not created equal. There is no way that you should go to the store, buy the first fish oil you see, and start taking it. You need to read the labels. The two chief components of omega-3 fatty acids are DHA, doxahexanoic acid, or docosahexanoic acid, or EPA, icopentanoic acid, and the two of these in a specific combination can probably benefit brain health over time. But I say probably because different people with different genes may respond differently. So for example, people with high cholesterol and people with at least one or two variants of the ApoE4, those people may preferentially respond. So these are key take-home points. In terms of the dose, while we don't know exactly for sure, at least 900 to 1,000 milligrams of DHA per day and at least 500 to 600 milligrams of EPA a day are the minimum that I recommend in our clinical practice. But we titrate these levels up depending on the blood markers that we find and track over time. Another important point is fish oil can come from fish or fish oil can actually come from algae. Fish oil is a misnomer. The fish eat the algae, the omega-3s are in the algae, and you can actually just buy capsules of omega-3s from algae. So this is an algae-based fish oil which has been studied in multiple randomized trials to be successful, or if you want it from the fish, purified from fish, you can get it that way too. Another important thing about fish oil that I hear from my patients all the time is, I can't take fish oil, the pills are too big. I understand, I have my little pill box, I organize it once a month, I have four one-week pill boxes, and I can't barely fit these in the pill box, let alone down my throat. So what do you need to do? I buy the smaller pills. So again, we need to identify the amount of omega-3s, we need to identify the size of the pill that works for you, and then implement and track over time. The other supplement that I think warrants some attention is something called curcumin or turmeric. Turmeric, which is a root, is a spice, it's in curry, and it's probably very brain healthy. But the problem is when curry supplements, turmeric or curcumin, were initially studied with Alzheimer's disease, these supplements were not effective. In fact, when people took the supplements, and they checked the blood, the curcumin wasn't even absorbed. Why? Well, we know that when we cook with curry and it's emulsified with fats, guess what? Like we talked about before, like with vitamin D, curcumin may be better absorbed. The other part is maybe it wasn't the right type of curcumin. And again, the devil is in the details here. When it comes to curcumin, a recent study in the last few years showed that a specific type of curcumin that is nanoparticle based called theracurmin, I have nothing to disclose, no relationships with any supplement or vitamin companies, but based on the evidence, a randomized study showed that using this nanoparticle version, small particles that were better able to be absorbed, actually delayed amyloid accumulation in the brains of people at risk for Alzheimer's. So, the whole topic of vitamins and supplements are a complicated one. And I understand that there's lots of people across all age ranges that aren't exactly excited about taking pills. But the take home point is number one, most people, the majority, but not all, should be able to get adequate amounts of nutrients in eating a whole food diet and a diet like you see in front of us. But in a, a reasonable number of cases, at least 20, 30, even 40% of cases sometimes, again, depending on age and depending on uh, dietary patterns, using vitamins and supplements can certainly be a brain healthy approach. And finally, there are dozens and dozens of supplements that I did not talk about today. I'm not saying these other supplements don't work, but the evidence that of the supplements and vitamins we talked about just now are by far the most evidence-based and something to consider.